Uh, first up today is uh, Dr. Diana Echevarria. Um, and Dr. Echevarria is, uh, has earned her master's in industrial hygiene and her PhD in environmental health from the University of Michigan where she serves as a full professor. She's been an occupational health researcher and manager at Battelle Memorial Institute in Arlington, Virginia, down the street from where I am, uh, for 31 years. Her long-term etiological research focuses, focus promotes early detection of acute and chronic central and peripheral nervous system uh, mental health effects for industrial workers, war fighters, and the more vulnerable populations such as children and older adults exposed to neurotoxicants, pesticides, and heavy metals such as mercury. Most recently, she has developed a new human performance cognitive awareness portable testing device for the military, public vehicle operators, and safety uh, per personnel. Dr. Echevarria has served for six years on the NIH Health Study Reviewing Grant Proposals and is guest editor for the British Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine. She's completed 66 peer-reviewed publications, 55 major reports, and over 100 abstracts and presentations. And currently, I'm proud to tell you that she is now our newest addition to our scientific advisory board for this academy. So please welcome, with a nice academy welcome, to Dr. Diana Echevarria. So the first uh, order of business is to read a disclaimer that I don't have any financial interest or products in my talk that I'm not selling. I'm educating. Um, and I don't offer grant money on this dental and medical educational program, right? So this is a strictly a educational forum to e summarize in general, the last 30 years of research in mercury toxicity and susceptibility. And the reason why I thought it would be of interest is because this population has a serious professional interest in looking at restoration materials and their health effects. And importantly, the exposures that I see in this population now overlap with that of the general population. Occupational exposures used to be exceedingly high compared to dentists, much higher. I currently work with minors around 500 micrograms per deciliter or 500 micrograms per liter in urine. That's not the experience of an American dentist. <laughs> Those are the experiences of people that mine with gold with mercury. The dental population is magnitudes less. And in fact, the levels now approximate that of the general population so we can look at health effects in two populations and understand how the mechanisms work in the groups. So I'm an epidemiologist and will not spend this time working on um, presenting to you the, bio, the toxicity uh, biochemistry as much as the health effect, okay? And we'll start by looking at uh, primarily uh, dentists, then children, and then older adults. This is the work of a team. It's not just me. Uh, Jim Woods, who many of you may have heard of. Vasa Poshian, who's a member of this current board. He was my mentor. Alva Bittner, a statistician, and Nick Heyer, an epidemiologist, who have been honestly the same team for almost 30 years. <laughs> so it's a very stable group of researchers. And because money is a problem, we work on multiple grants at the same time. And so this is my only slide that says where I get funded. And most of it is from the National Institute of Health. <coughs> when you look at epi, you're looking at exposure effect relationships. You're looking at whether dose matters and what kind of dose matters. And you're looking at susceptibility, which is really in my uh, world is 
more narrowly defined as genetic factors that impact behavior. Because if you put an environmental exposure together with a genetic uh, aberration that increases the ability for you to detect health effect, that's the business of how we set thresholds for standards, right? So that's really where the evidence is driven from. We always control for age, race, gender, education in adults, um, and it's really important, in, uh, especially for alcohol. If we have behavioral outcomes, you have to control for things that alter behavior. <laughs> So symptoms, mood, motor function, and cognitive skill are the domains that are impacted by mercury. Uh, I think in terms of history, people knew more about the symptomology and the mood because of the Mad Hatter syndrome, but we've gone beyond that to look at effects that you can't see, that you don't observe. These are things that allow you to be uh, assessed on a psychomotor test battery, for example. Uh, the, so this, the discipline borrows from a lot of cognitive testing and specifically clinical psychology, believe it or not. So the tools that we use are derived from clinical psychology in this domain. Looking at dentists, a three-year study was done, 400 folks, um, and uh, we looked at urine and blood kidney function tests basic industrial hygiene because I needed to understand the magnitude of nitrous oxide, the magnitude of mercury use in your uh, workplaces. And uh, because we are interested in dose, we also looked at DMPS, thanks to Vasa Pushian, um, in a subset of the people to understand the difference in the profile between chronic exposure and immediate effect, right? So if I measure a mercury measure now, today. It reflects the last three months of exposure at best. It doesn't really reflect cumulative exposure. So if you chelate somebody, you're actually extracting from reserves in the body. And they may not be all biologically available, but it's what's stored in your system, right? And so with the chelators, we can remove that. And then we compare the profile of CNS deficits and mood against two kinds of mercury measures. Right? And the advantage of that is that you can distinguish recent or subchronic health effect from a cumulative long term health effect. Right? That's the distinction between the two interpretations. So, neurobehavior, kind of like IQ, doesn't really address the upper two lines here. Anticipation, goal, planning, monitoring, drive, sequencing. These are very higher order cognitive ability. And no test battery can get that close because there are too many pathways to actually plan, to actually sequence what you're going to do over a day. Too many ways that the brain can allow you to make a decision. So I like to simplify my life and go down to the more basic elements that contribute to IQ that contribute to executive function. And we're looking at short-term memory, which is nothing other than attention. By the way, that really is what short-term memory is. It is truly your ability to attend, to pay attention, right? And what impacts paying attention? How moody you are. So if you've got stress in your life, if you feel anxious, if you feel depressed, your ability to attend is actually impaired. So we look at attention because it's sensitive to things that are associated with mercury. Alertness as a control language, it will never be impacted by mercury because that's extremely uh, resistant to environmental insult. That's probably the last thing that goes. We know that true for dementia too, right? You can talk right up into the end with dementia, not Alzheimer's, I'm talking about dementia. That's because it's resistant to decay. Uh, so it's often used as a control measure. People use in test batteries language to control for IQ, to control for your cognitive ability. Visual spatial skills, motor function, autonomic systems, uh, not too many are associated with mercury, but some have an overlap. 
cognition from the point of view of complex decision making, but and and reaction to whether something is a yes or a no. But cognition is very simple in my domain. It's not the complex thing like IQ. Memory has two parts, long term, short term, and sensory, because in this case, especially with dentists, your hands have to detect what you're working with. <laughs> you have to be able to process that piece of information through your fingers. So if you've got vibration sensitivity or if you've got deficits in coordination, we need to know that. So we work down at the bottom, right at the very bottom of this list. Our test batteries are long. PNS tests, peripheral nervous system tests are two hours long. CNS tests are one hour long. And we use these tests as essentially ways of discriminating profiles of whether you have a change or not in your performance. If I just used one test, I would not be sensitive to you <laughs> as a person. I would only be eliciting one facet of the profile. So to get at the profile, we have to use multiple tests and we look at differentials and it is interpretable, by the way. <laughs> it's not impossible to do. Um, and there's a clinical basis for test selection. So we know what classic materialism already looks like. I'm not starting from nah, nowhere. We have lots of publications before we began that identified psychosomatic symptoms, affect, motor function, and again, simple mental capacity, logical reasoning, but um, not complex ones like IQ. So motor function, before we began, I just wanted to show you that around 50 micrograms per liter, there are at least 11 studies that showed tremor and hand-eye coordination were uh, really key components of mercury exposure effects, health effects. Motor function, lots of different tests, lots of different ones. No one has the domain on the best way to measure motor function. So you're gonna keep on seeing pressure on this field they will always change the tests because there's no one test that captures every facet. Cognitive populations that, I mean, dental populations that were done before I began also demonstrated the same sort of tests that I use now. So we're building the argument based on what other people have done. And uh, most of the time, what, when we began, Levels in the dental population in the 19, early 1990s are probably double, maybe even triple, from what they are now. So I would like actually to recognize that fact when you look at these slides, is that our levels in these studies are higher than what exists today. I hope that's in part due to our work, <laughs> but I'm not sure. <laughs> so um, symptoms and mood is the last piece because we started with chloralkali workers who had levels that are well above 50, perhaps 100 micrograms per liter. Um, and there are, again, multiple tools that are used in our field because no one instrument captures the full domain. So that our study, we had 1,488 dentists for the state of Washington that were registered that Sent, signed a consent form and said, please measure my urine. That's all we did. And then we looked at those individuals and removed in, uh, those that had problems like diabetes and so forth and came up with 188 dentists and 233 dental assistants. This is a cohort that was established tw almost 20 years ago. And it's still an active cohort today. Uh, the years in practice back then were quite substantial, so we had a lot of um, homogeneity, and this is a good thing, because when you have homogeneity in a population, it allows you to see subtle differences that you couldn't detect. So when you have very complex populations from all kinds of origins, all kinds of workplaces, it's very hard to see a neurobehavioral deficit cleanly. So what's beautiful about these kinds of studies is that it's really one kind of worker <laughs> with one kind of job <laughs> and does it for a long time <laughs> and is very good at it. Uh, so I, I basically think from an epidemiologic perspective, we have eliminated a lot of the variants that would mess up the answers for how we're looking. <laughs> 
So it's a strong study from that perspective. Industrial hygiene, as we said, was going to the workplace and measuring nitrous oxide, measuring uh, mercury, and taking a blood sample for genetic testing as well as a, you know, a swab. We also did urinary measures. Now this was back in 1998. So you could see that the dental population in Washington State was around 2.51, and the general population for dentals back in those eras was at 5.27. I am sure it's at least half that now. I do not believe that's true anymore. But this was the levels that we were working with, and the distributions you can see down there. We know what are the risk factors for amalgam because we have models that we created. And the key ones are ones that you already know. How many placements you put in, how many restorative placements, and how many you remove are, even with controls, even with controls, you still have exposures, okay? Um, and I know the composite numbers have increased since this study, but we were looking at between 17 to 14 per uh, week at that time in this particular population. <coughs> Our predictors <coughs> were personal amalgam in your mouth. The number of restorations that you uh, work with uh, per week, what job you have, whether you're a dental assistant or whether you're a surgeon or what kind of dentist you were mattered. Uh, what scavenger systems you used, which were not that prominent back then. 1998, actually, I think they were less prominent than now, and how many hours a week you worked. These are all make sense, right? I mean, there's nothing, it shouldn't be rocket science. This is absolute clear, clear, clear model. Test battery, just as I said, was pretty long, and they all agreed to come to my lab and uh, be, be measured, which was really uh, quite, a, quite a feat. So we set up a system where we had dentists come to our behavioral test sessions, oh geez, over one year. <laughs> we did it three times. Many tests should not be impacted by mercury. They're called control tests. And so here are control tests, and all they demonstrate to you on this slide is that they're stable. They don't really change, and that's very good. <laughs> Behavior doesn't have to be measured by individual tests. You can also do it by factors. So the the, the entities at the top are how these tests are grouped. So the ones that we care about are visual memory and reaction time, uh, coordination, and the switching not so much because that's getting into that higher order zone. Switching attention, right, between things. That ability to move from one topic area to another, to one stimulus to another. That is beginning to work at the higher end of your brain, not the lower end of the brain, and so should be less sensitive to the impact of mercury. This is a hand steadiness device. It's important that you see what it looks like because one of the key findings is the utility of this particular test. You put a, a little stylus in a hole for a certain amount of time, and we want to be sure that you don't touch the edges and it gets harder and harder and harder, as you can see, right? So you start at a simple big hole and you go all the way down to the little hole. That's called hand steadiness. The number of hits and the amount of contact time on the edges is the primary measure. So it's a really good thing if you are using your hands for a living to know whether or not you've got good hand steadiness. This is a very good test. The other tests are on a computer. So for example, short-term memory, your given a set of numbers on a screen. There's nine numbers. They're done in a sequence. You don't actually see the bar at the top all the whole time. And they're, they're uh, colored. And you just have to recognize the order in which they appear and then type in the order later, right? So a presentation of a stimulus, and then you write down the answer. Membering patterns is what we call visual memory. So you're given a complex pattern that looks like what you see here and then three patterns, and you have to decide which one you saw. Kind of complicated, right? You're, that's called visual memory. <laughs> Symbol digit is this thing on the other side of the screen where you have to match a set of symbols to numbers, right? So you're coding in this case. You've got a stimulus of a picture. You've got a number 
which you know from long-term memory, and your job is to integrate the two and select which number goes with the picture that you see in the order. And symbol digit is very sensitive to mercury, symbol digit detection of um, matching the, it's a matching task actually. The one at the bottom is one of the hardest because it's a discordant thing. You have a box that's either on the left or the right, and you have to say whether you agree with the verdict, which is in the middle. So in this case, you've got a box that's on the left-hand side, but it says right. And you have to say, is that the same or different? So you're making a decision or a cognitive decision, yes, no, right? And you're basing it on reasoning of direction. <laughs> so this is a more complicated test. And finally, you know, our, our trail making, which is the thing that you see on the other box down at the bottom, where you have to just identify the sequence of numbers in the right way. This is also extremely sensitive to mercury. Most people don't do this very well. And you know what's interesting about the bottom test is that if you alternate numbers and letters, like 1A, 2B, 3C, right, in the same pattern, it's much more complicated. So that's known as trails making A and B with numbers and numbers and letters. Finger speed, really rapid tapping, really fast, left hand, right hand, and then alternate. Reaction time is the time it takes you to lift your finger off the box and then move it to the target, right? So it's a motor function and a cognitive function because you have to decide to lift your finger. So that's called lift. And then you move your finger to the top. So the reaction time is the classic, basic, most fundamental neural behavioral test in the world, <laughs> all right? This is the beginning. <laughs> it was probably designed in 1800s. <laughs> I mean, it's been around a very long time. Um, and information processing is where you had given a series of, of, of colors and you have to decide when a stimulus comes on where that series fits. So this is a type of testing that we did and we linked it to genes. And what's important on this slide is really just the pattern. Don't, don't focus on numbers because that's not really the smart thing to do. For session one and session two and session three, CPOX, BDNF, COMT, and 5-HHT, each of these is a gene which has a polymorphism. The, the number of normal ones is the high number. So like 273 is normal. But 89 and six are either mutations that are heterogeneous or full mutations. So the numbers that are full mutations are very small, right, compared to the numbers that are heterogeneous. And when we do neurobehavioral studies, we're trying to see whether those individuals that have a polymorphism are in fact different from the people that don't. So I'm comparing 273 to 89, let's say, or 273 to six, those six people are the people that would differentiate whether this gene matters. So it's very, very few people that actually have a genetic polymorphism that you would call full, a full one, not a heterogeneous one. So I just wanted you to be aware that the, the reliance on large size populations is critical because the number of people with variants is small, right? And those are the people that drive the analysis. Okay, so why do we do 5-HHLPR as a gene? What does it do? It's a transporter gene. We know it's uh, associated with mood disorders. So just from a face validity perspective, if you care about the concept of early warning systems and mad as a hatter aberrations, you would want to look at genes that impact mood, that impact depression and agitation and anxiety. So that's why it was selected. <laughs> it has a, a lot of other properties, but this, the key one, the key driver is, is that it, it actually is associated with mood or affect. If you look at mood then and say to yourself, is 5-HHT important? Does it matter? In dentists, urinary mercury really didn't impact uh, mood that much. But 5-HHT, the ones in blue, are the ones that were affiliated or associated with 5-HTTPR variants. So in fact, our gene in very small numbers of people detected effects, right? It's a good 
tool. It's a good way of inserting into a epidemiologic study a probe into determining whether or not mercury has an impact on a population, right? So the profile here says men are more resistant that are dentists or women are more resistant that are dentists, right? but they are not resistant to the impact of this genetic aberration called a polymorphism in 5-HHTP. And it's not just one instrument. We did it on three instruments, okay? How about dental assistants, the majority of which were women? They're the blue, the sea of blue suddenly explodes, right? <laughs> so you have many more effects with both urinary mercury and 5-HTTPR. There is an additive effect size, and there's a full change. Those are the two columns on the far right. And in, in fact, just even independent of which uh, particular instrument you use, that what this tells you is that you're then able to see whether or not the effect has a, goes beyond a, a, an additive effect. One and one is not two. One and one may be five. But we actually never found that. We actually never did. This is strictly one plus one equals two. Mercury plus 5-HTP, the effect of both, is the sum of the two. But it, there's no synergy. There's no reason to think that it, in fact, increases susceptibility, okay? It just means that you have two agents that impact behavior simultaneously, all right? And dentists, how about behavior, neurobehavior? So the yellow sea of color is associated with each seriously, statistically significant change in performance. And you can see most tests were. And the ones in blue were the ones that were also impacted by 5-HTTPR. And very few tests actually had both. And that's the message I want to send is that very few tests were sensitive to both mercury and the genetic presence of a variant. Dental assistants, no. Dental assistants had much more of an integrated model where the two uh, exposures, mercury and the genetic polymorphism, actually had an additive effect on, uh, with significant magnitudes of change. Well, these are the primary tests that were impacted. The one that's called hand steadiness, the finger tapping one, and short-term memory. Why, what do they have in common? It's your ability to pay attention. <laughs> it's your ability to get focus on actually processing and completing the task. And I believe that's the fundamental way in which mercury seems to impact performance. It's mostly through attention. It's mostly, and if anything that impacts attention is going to be uh, impacted. So this is just one example. And these three tests are very good at finding it. What about the other genetic factors? There are others. We studied CPOX4. It is involved in the heme synthetic pathway. Uh, porphyrins are also known to be associated with King George's condition back in the uh, early 1900s. And so we really thought, well, maybe we should be looking at this gene and its aberrations to see if we could use it as a biomarker. So we started this a long time ago, and in fact, it does work. Just one slide on biochemistry. This is the only one, <laughs> okay? Uh, this is this, the heme uh, synthetic pathway, and heme is at the last one on the bottom under the lower quadrant there. And the only ones that we think are important are the inter uh, forms for porphyrins and pro, uh, C2, well, it's called coprophorin, which is down at the bottom. These are the ones that are too early in the sequence to see any uh, effects with behavior. We're looking for a biomarker, right? So we're not looking for a causal agent. We're looking for something that would indicate, yes, you may have a performance deficit that's easier than a three-hour test battery. That's the problem, right? You can't give three-hour test batteries to the full population of the world, but maybe you could take a urine sample and determine whether or not the porphyrin levels are high enough to see if they could potentially be impacted. So that's the value of looking at a urinary marker. It's on the exon 4, so N2 
SEC-72H is the physical location of the CPOX-4. There is a CPOX-5, but it doesn't seem to have the same potency. So when we tested for it, only the CPOX-4 was the primary one that worked. Here's a profile of unexposed versus exposed populations. Um, and you can see that there are spikes in the ISO and in the COPRA porphyrins. And that's the change that we would see in a population if we were to do a screen at a dental meeting, right? So if I went and measured a whole population of people that routinely are exposed to a, a agents like mercury and even lead, by the way, different profile, um, you would imagine that you would see spikes in specific porphyrins. And that's the differential that we're looking at. Why do we care about BDNF? It's a different gene, totally different. This one deals with uh, regulation of uh, striatal neurons. And it seems to have a history of reducing hippocampus activation. And for me, that's important because that impacts memory. So if I have a gene that actually impacts memory, I want to know <laughs> whether or not mercury plus a change in that gene would in fact potentiate an effect. Again, we're looking down at the bottom. The genes that BDNF impact would be the ones in yellow, right? Those are the ones that matter. So we do regression models separately for dentists and dental assistants. We control for age and alcohol, premorbid intelligence, that means before you start work, and visual acuity, can you see well, and whether you're taking any medications from allergies because those impact neurobehavioral. Um, outcomes as well. Uh, we also add level of education for dental assistants because the variation in dental assistant education is much higher than for dentists. Dentists, it's pretty uniform, but for dental assistants, it's not. So this is another way of looking at deficits. <laughs> Instead of looking at betas that, and a p-value, this fixed number of people in studies allow you to just use the standardized coefficient for an effect. So the magnitude on the bar, the height of the bar, is how strong the association is with the agent, whether it's mercury or BDNF. So you can see the lines that are for a p-value of 0.05 all sort of achieve significance for whether it's digit span, which is attention, visual reproductions, which is your ability to draw pictures that look the same as the stimulus that you just saw, your short-term memory, which is digit span forward, and uh, long-term, a little pattern memory, which is visual memory. So it's not relying on digits, it's relying on pictures. Most of the mercury is in the white bars, and the blue is BDNF. So we do have differences between whether a gene or a mercury impacts, but there is some that have joint effect, right? Dental assistance, there's more joint effects, which is kind of good. Um, and, but the pattern's not identical, and that's what I want you to know. The women who are dental assistants, and there were very few men in my population that were dental assistants, um, really did have a different profile than the dental dentist himself. There were other psychomotor-related uh, effects as well that showed symbol digit rates, pattern discrimination, and vigilance, which is long-term attention over a period of time, were also impacted, less so, but uh, were definitely important for the two populations. Motor function, this is the one that most people care about the most, because that, that's the reaction time, that's the hand tremor, that's your ability to coordinate your hand and your eye together, right? Um, those are the ones that, that were both impacted by mercury and BDNF in both populations. So that's important to know, too. And what's interesting here is that with that hand steadiness test, as the number of holes increased, you can see the sensitivity of the study dropped, right? So it was really the big holes that gave us the biggest bang for our buck. It wasn't the hard little ones at the end. It was the big hole, which meant that it's your ability to actually put the stimulus into the hole that probably mattered. Hand coordination, right? Nerve conduction velocity is a peripheral nervous system test. It hand deals with tremor. And this is probably a, a 
very germane thing for dentists to recognize that we don't want anyone with a history of repetitive trauma <laughs> to have any impairment in their hand-eye coordination. So we do look at nerve conduction velocity as sort of a last test that's got a more clinical significance. It's the only one that actually has clinical significance because the rest of the tests that we use, you can use as early warning systems, but they don't tell you that you're impaired for psychologically for life. They only tell you that you're impaired for the level of mercury that you're experiencing at the moment, right? And since the half-life of mercury is three months, it doesn't really express more than your last three months of exposure. That's the effect we're looking at, all right? We're not looking at cumulative long-term effect here. We're looking at the uh, effect that's dependent on the half-life in your body. But when it comes to nerve conduction, that actually has a chronic component to it and a stronger clinical component. So the interpretation is a lot more important, okay? Uh, we did find latencies were significantly impaired in a subset of people, especially with those with a history of repetitive trauma, but that's interpretable, right? If you compare mercury to BDNF and CPOX4, the, I don't know if you can see the little red lines that go across for the significance level, but it's pretty much around 0.12. Motor function, it was impaired by mercury and the two genes. Psychomotor was iffy because BDNF didn't really impact psychomotor function. And CPOX4 for cognitive flexibility was the most strongest, but mercury wasn't. So you can differentiate here between domains. That motor function, critical, psychomotor, mixed, more, less critical, but as important. And cognitive flexibility is not a central player in the toxicity for these levels of exposure. The levels are too low, okay? That's what that means. And that's good, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> right? So the boxes in blue are the ones that we focus on for BDNF. The boxes in orange are the ones that we focus on for CPOX4. And that's how neural behavior works. It allows you to look at these different domains and assign a deficit to one or the other of the boxes. COMT is catechol-O-methyltransferase. It is associated with dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. This is why it's important to us. And we'd like to know whether or not mercury in the presence of COMT alters symptoms, right? <laughs> so here we're looking at symptomology, depression, headache, confusion. And uh, the dental assistants were more pronounced than the dentists for a uh, heterogeneous, of, meaning a mixture of mutant and non-mutant, but the strong mutation ones for COMT were only in the dentists, so it was more pronounced. But look what it impacted. It impacted coordination. So it's you self-reporting that you have problems with coordination that picked up COMT, right? That's what it picked up. It did not pick up depression or confusion. Basically, remember, these are self-reported because you have to tell us on a form whether or not you feel depressed, whether you have issues. <coughs> In the full model, d dental assistants were basically, I think, significantly impacted, and you could see this, um, both linearly, that means there was a dose response for uh, the depression, for fatigue, for confusion, and overall. So this is a pretty useful probe into symptomology. It does a better job than BDNF, a way better job than CPOX. So that's why we include it into the genetic mix. The study strengths overall of this kind of a study is that we've got really good epidemiology. That's what it is. You're choosing your populations very carefully so that you can see subtle changes in behavior. That's the value of being a good epidemiologist because you have to control the variance in the both populations. Our test batteries were very sensitive, and we were able to see impact of mercury in very subtle changes, very subtle changes. The public health significance is that we don't care about genes. This is important to recognize. Standards are not based on genetic susceptibility. They're only based on something that you can measure because regulators look at this and go, what do you mean? 
<laughs> how can I set a standard for safety when I have susceptible populations? We don't even do that for children in lead, I want you to know. So this whole issue of looking at inherited risk or a genetic variance or now the new term is personalized medicine, I'm really wondering how you set standards based on individual differences. And so far, we haven't been doing a good job of doing that because we don't set our driving standards based on whether or not you can drive. We base it on how much blood alcohol you have, right? So if I did a test battery for driving, which is five tests, it takes about half an hour, that would be far more informative <laughs> on whether you could drive or not. But it's not used because there's too much individual variability. So people really prefer to use a fixed number called BAC, right, as an indicator of whether you're impaired for driving. But they don't measure how you drive, right? So that's the problem with neurobehavioral testing and standard setting. It's subject to individual differences. But I take advantage of that as a researcher so I can see very subtle changes in a linear dose-response manner, right? That's the discipline. What happens when you change the dose? You're no longer looking at immediate mercury. You're looking at cumulative mercury. And we do that through chelation with DMPS. And DMPS is only one chelator. There are new variants on the, um, or new versions of chelators that are uh, being uh, afforded since we've done this study. But we only had this one at the time. And this was done, I think, in 1990, no, 2002 or 2003. So it came a little later. DMPS is a strong uh, model in, uh, in terms of prediction. It's correlations around 0.43. So from the point of view of predicting uh, spot levels, it's extremely important. It, same sort of predictors matter in terms of personal amalgam in your mouth, whether or not you wear protection and how many restorations you do. But remember, this is stored mercury. This is not mercury that you have in your bloodstream or have in your kidney that is just bioavailable. This is a mercury that you actually have to pull out of a tissue, soft tissue. And therefore, it's not going to look the same. The question is, is whether cognitive scores differ for the two measures of exposure? And the answer is yes, they do. So cumulative chronic health effect that's associated with a DMPS chelated urinary measure is a very different profile than if I took your urine today and simply did a test battery on you. And I'd have to compare the differences. And that's what this study did, OK? In terms of attention, <clears throat> DMPS did a stronger job than the spot sample. Spot sample meaning the urine of the day. In terms of visual processing, DMPS picked up two of the four tests, but uh, actually the spot sample did just as well. So we do see some differentials, but we are definitely seeing more effects with the chronic long-term exposure. What about mood? What would be your prediction there? Mood was not as strongly associated with long-term mercury. It was more associated with the labile short-term measure of exposure. So um, you can attribute fatigue and confusion and anger to short, last three months of exposure more readily than to what's stored in your body, <laughs> OK? Um, how about motor function? Long-term effects are associated with a long-term measure of exposure, right? So it's much stronger for hand steadiness, simple reaction time, and finger tapping than the immediate measure of, of mercury. And when you look at symptoms, symptoms are actually long-term, not short-term. And they're more strongly associated with a chelated version of mercury. Here's the difference. The first bars that are clear are the spot sample. The chelated bars are in yellow. So there's a huge shift, right? And that's what the profile looks like. Symptoms, mood, motor, and cognition. I'm going to um, actually fast forward here to whether or not we've got a threshold. Is there a threshold for a mercury effect? Well, here's a, a graph for simple reaction time, which is very objective, and symptoms, which is self-reported. 
And the answer is no. In this particular study, we found no threshold. That's an important thing from a regulator's point of view. There is a dose response that actually starts at the lowest level possible. And that's, that's the real lesson of this particular study. I really think that's probably the most important, important one. So here's the picture that we presented uh, and published. In kids, the base model differed. Now, this is interesting. In children, we have slightly, well, I should really back up a little bit. We have slightly higher um, levels of mercury at the beginning. Whoops, I'm going the wrong direction, aren't I? Give me a second. I got to figure out how to use this thing. Oh, no, I'm going the wrong way. Must be this one, right? See, it's a, this is an, a, a behavioral test, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so if you look at the mercury levels at the bottom, it's not that different, 1.48, 1.47. This is exactly the levels that we saw in dental assistance. That's the thing I wanted to link to. Um, and the effects are basically more related to the cumulative mercury than the maximal amount of mercury, and CPOX4, in fact, was additive. In other words, one plus one is not two. One plus one is more like three or four. This is the only study we've ever done where we've seen an interaction, a true interaction between mercury and a genetic marker. And that's an important thing for children because we're dealing with susceptible populations. Right? So our finding there is that we are, in fact, seeing a difference between adults and kids because of an interaction. But we only did it with one gene, CPOX4. It didn't work with the other genes. We tried it, but it didn't work. <coughs> in older adults, we looked at fish as well as urinary mercury. And mercury, in terms of fish meals per week, did impact declarative memory, which is word memory, as well as finger speed for women. These are people over the age of 80. <coughs> Different population, much older, but we're still seeing the same profile, and that's the important thing, okay? So when you look at these kinds of studies, in older people and in children and in regular adults, what is the conclusion that we have? What would be the conclusion that you would most want to do next? In my opinion, I think the gap is that we do not know anything about inherited risk. I think what we need to do is we need to look at families that are exposed to mercury at high levels who have a polymorphism and see if their children are at even higher risk today. Because if you inherit a genetic aberration and you're exposed to mercury, that cohort of kids that grow up should have worse performance deficits. That hasn't been done yet. And that's the next study that needs to be done. So that well, hopefully we'll do that in Brazil. <laughs> because we don't have high enough populations uh, that are exposed in the United States. Um, to, to be able to do this well. I thought about doing it in dentists and dental assistants, but I'd like to do it at a higher exposure first and then come and repeat that study at a very low exposure and see if we see the same profile. So the next step is inherited risk, right, as opposed to immediate risk, which is what we've studied to date. But we see it, same things, in uh, older adults, children, and uh, regular garden variety folk. So this is not anything um, that I think would consider, you know, an aberration. This is part of nature's ability to respond to a toxicant, right? Um, in summary, <coughs> the trends, I honestly think, show that we have less than four micrograms as a pretty good target for seeing deficits in behavior. Dose matters, absolutely. There are differences between chronic and short-term mercury levels. And we have added effects in adults, but true interaction effects in children.
which goes with the idea that kids are susceptible, right? So that's basically the take-home message. Mercury's bad for you. <laughs> now you know why <laughs> from a behavioral point of view, right? Thank you very much. <laughs>